Barcelona, Spain. Oh, beautiful. Okay, so um, welcome everybody. Welcome to Conscious Cafe Global. Uh, tonight, this morning, whatever time of day you're at, welcome to you. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, Conscious Cafe session today, uh, another very, really popular one. And it is Food as Medicine with Roger Green, and Roger's here with us. Hi, Roger. Hi, everyone. Good to see you all. <laughs> We've got a nice global audience, haven't we, as we've just been finding out. So um, Roger is known for his extremely content rich sessions. So I hope you're relaxed. You've got a notepad and a pen and a drink and you're ready to take in some really great information. Even if you know a lot about health, well-being and cooking, you are going to learn a lot tonight. So let me uh, share about Roger. Roger is a holistic health expert a pioneer he's had the uh, developed the academy of healing nutrition about 40 years ago and created what he calls this longevity diet which he says we haven't all put it to the test yet roger but living well to 120 and that's the idea as he was just sharing about his 120 diet. plus okay 120 plus <laughs> yeah why limit yourself to 120 that's right thank you for the correction <laughs> So, um, as we just found out, Roger is um, is from New Zealand, where he is now with uh, with, with family. Uh, spends most of his time now in Australia. I'm sure he'll tell you about all the places he's been. Um, well, still uh, New York and and Sydney, uh, Gina. Yeah, a lot of time in New York still. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where you have your Academy of Healing Nutrition, which has now gone global and digital. And I have been a participant in that in the last year, and it truly is life changing. Uh, I knew a lot about healthy food. Um, I've been a whole food cook for many years, but I learned many new distinctions and still am learning. And I think once you enter this field, you really become a lifelong learner, constantly looking at things. And the, the idea really, as Roger shares, is to be in charge of your own well-being in as much as you can with uh, foods and herbs. And the more you know, the better. Um, just to say that Roger has uh, taught thousands of students in 70 countries. I first met Roger in the 1990s and invited him to teach in my feng shui school in London. And he, I don't know, I might ask you, Roger, how many miles have you clocked up flying to all these courses that you've done? Have you ever counted? Yeah, because you can keep track with it, with the frequent flyer points. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, yeah, it's over 5 million miles. Really? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> so uh, I mentioned about the Academy of Healing Nutrition. They run uh, courses now twice a year. There's another one coming up in the spring, and he will, I'm sure he will talk about that. Um, and what Roger is going to share is uh, about the way Eastern thinking, Eastern medicine, um, Eastern cooking can be integrated with our knowledge of Western foods, Western medicines. In addition to his passion for natural healing and foods, he's also the director of the Academy of Sacred Geometry, uh, Feng Shui seminars, and he sponsored many dozens of tours and retreats and conferences around the world. I've been on those. I've been to China with Roger and Iceland, and they were wonderful programs. Um, he has a strong passion for a sustainable planet, um, has sponsored many alternative energy conferences and helped in inventions move forward, including coal fusion and the Therified device, which is a very interesting device. And maybe we'll get you back to Conscious Cafe to talk about that. But for now, mm -hmm. let's give you a nice warm welcome from all around the globe, Conscious Cafe. And uh, over to you, Roger, to share with us about Buddhist medicine. Welcome. Great. Uh, well, thanks. Um... Gina, and thanks to the uh, Conscious Cafe. It's a, a great concept you you gals have got, uh, Judy and uh, Gina. Uh, it's just wonderful to be able to share values, share ideas with uh, conscious people. <laughs> um, so as Gina said, uh, it's content rich. Uh, I've got uh, a slide presentation. Uh, hopefully that will give us uh, a little bit of structure to try and cover some major points around food as medicine. So the perspective I take on this, and I've been doing it for pretty much 40 years now, is that I started to just simply, first of all, for my own health, obviously, that's where uh, everybody pretty much starts in the world of uh, natural medicine. Uh, they have 
you know, like a bit of a health crisis going on. Um, and that's certainly what happened to me. I was a product of the 70s. <laughs> I think you know what I mean by that. And uh, I had uh, just, uh, got chronic uh, fatigue. And I noticed that starting to tweak my diet, I was living in London at the time, and it had a, a radical impact on my health just by changing sort of three or four things and then starting to get to know a little bit about uh, yin and yang, like warming and cooling and how you can eat for the seasons and how there's uh, these wonderful traditional foods that uh, we have pretty much forgotten uh, in, the, in the West, and what's generally what we call ancestral eating now. Right? And so I had uh, radical improvements in my health and I also noticed that it was affecting me emotionally and, and psychologically. I was a clearer thinker, uh, uh, emotionally, I was more calm. And so I discovered uh, this connection between food and your emotions and your spirit. Right? And so that took me down the track of traditional Chinese medicine or what you might also call Taoist philosophy. Uh, which is this wonderful world of natural healing and martial arts and feng shui and uh, herbs and food as medicine and massage, etc. We call that the eight rays of traditional Chinese medicine, this philosophical core that can then get applied to all of these things in life. So then I went back to uh, Australia and started one of the first natural health centers there and that's when I discovered that you really need a cooking school to back up what you're saying and teaching people around food as medicine, because you might have noticed, guys, it sort of goes in one ear and out the other very, very quickly, because food is the biggest uh, habit we've got. Fundamentally, you know, it's the patterns from our parents, you know, that first seven years uh around your your family and what they were eating their attitudes around food and so we just soak all of that up and then we're in the information age now where there's lots of different trends coming in and different opinions different books uh you know everybody's always got you know something uh to to offer in that department but i i haven't had to change the direction of this curriculum for 40 years, because when you start to tap into things like uh, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic, or what I call time-tested theories and philosophies around food as medicine, you can really, really start to tap into these guidelines and principles that are sustainable, easy to do, uh, and you can start to discriminate between other dietary patterns and opinions, et cetera. And you also start to get familiar with this idea of being your own doctor in the sense you when you start to understand yin and yang, you can actually start to, you know, sort of, you know, when you get too cold, that's a yin condition. You can get uh, too hot. It's a, a more yang condition and things like this. So I, I started a cooking school to uh, complement the counseling I was doing. And what I noticed is once you inspired people around the actual dishes i mean what happens in dietary counseling sometimes is that you introduce some new foods that people simply have no idea how to use for instance seaweeds are incredibly important you know and you know full of the macro and the micro minerals that we need for strengthening our immune system our bones for alkalizing and for longevity longevity you need all of the minerals right and introducing people to uh, seaweeds, you know, people have to be shown how to do that and how to make it tasty and how to use it in stocks and salads and, and soups, etc. cetera. So uh, pretty much the curriculum has always been half theory and half practical. Uh, so it's a very grounded uh, curriculum, so to speak, you know. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears uh, and go to the slides. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully that's going to come up. And let's go to the 
slideshow. And uh, I presume, Gina, that that came up okay, yeah? I had to unmute, Roger. Yes, uh, I can say it beautifully. Thank you. It's good. Great. Okay, guys. So let me just do that. Okay, so uh, eating for longevity. Uh, so essentially eating has these two dynamics to it in the sense that we can use really good nutrition to prevent disease, which is primarily what the longevity is geared up for. As you know, now we live in a society with, you know, one in four people getting heart disease and, you know, roughly this one in three, one in four people getting cancer and uh, diabetes, blood sugar problems, respiratory problems, uh, uh, autoimmune uh, uh, diseases, etc. So modern uh, health statistics are uh, uh, kind of like a wake up call that we really, really not need to start to rethink everything around our, our nutrition. So uh, it, it, primarily it's used for let's not get sick in the first place by uh, strengthening our constitution, getting in uh, contact with our uh, local environment, uh, getting kind of uh, clear about what's, what's really, really good nutrition. And then secondly, it can be used as a therapy. Uh, there's particular, you know, special dishes and herbs that are very good for, uh, you know, strengthening the immune system, uh, strengthening the organ groups that we have in Chinese medicine. Very much uh, a lot of uh, food as medicine is geared up to strengthen, you know, the kidney chi, the liver chi, the heart chi, et cetera. So um, what we're going to cover today, we're going to cover food energetics to give you an idea of the energetic qualities of food. Obviously, that's quite a, a big subject that I can get you started. There's, uh, I, I think that's very, very important for Westerners to learn because we come from a, a reductionist scientific methodology, which is fantastic. I, I love science. Who doesn't? But the type of thinking, of course, is uh, very left brain, breaking things down into their components, looking at like a, what a, a molecule looks like. In, in, in Western nutrition, it's very much geared up that way. They talk about uh, you know, where are you going to get your vitamin C from, where are you going to get your, uh, uh, you know, various minerals and vitamins, etc. And you, you end up studying a lot of biochemistry, etc. Right? Whereas what we're doing is we, we can absorb that, but we are looking at the life force, the prana, the chi, right, and starting to connect with that. Uh, and that's what we call uh, food energetics. We're going to also explore cultures of longevity. I think it's very, very important because I always call that the proof in, is in the pudding. <laughs> These people uh, uh, up to 100 years ago, you could still visit, you know, up to the, before the Second World War, you could still visit cultures of longevity around the world that weren't contaminated by the so-called industrialized Western diet. And you had cultures that were eating their uh, traditional foods, right, and living well over 100, and they had no degenerative disease, and they had great uh, teeth, and they had happy children, and they had a supportive community. And when you start to study that, and there's some really, really good documentation that was done uh, in the 1930s, which I think is more important to look at than the so-called more modern writings uh, that were referred to as the blue zone diets that came out more like in the 1990s and the 1980s that uh, that sort of material for me is just slightly corrupted with their own agendas. Uh, so we're going to talk about that and we're going to break down some of the myths that we have, uh, particularly around fats and oils. So it's something like uh, I've been teaching for 40 years now. The longevity diet was never a low fat diet, right, which in my opinion has been an absolute disaster in the in the West has caused all sorts of havoc. Uh, we will talk a, a little bit further down the track about the holistic health training course that I've been running for many decades now, 
that gives people the sort of grounding and food as medicine for the rest of their life, right? Uh, and there's never any confusion when you start to study the energetics. And uh, I will talk very briefly at the end about a summer retreat that we're planning in uh, the UK in July next year, and very, very open to some questions happening. Now, this slide here gives you a little bit of idea of the, uh, you know, what we kind of do is, is food as medicine. We kind of start off with what you might call sort of gourmet whole food cooking, right? So, and we, we explore all of the food groups in this uh, curriculum, right? But uh, then a little bit more advanced level, we get into things like what we call Taoist herbs of longevity. And for instance, in the middle of this uh, slide here, that's a, a brew made with uh, some herbs and you might recognize the goji berries, which are very good for the building up the chi of the liver and nourishing the eyes. Uh, because of that connection between the eyes and the liver chi in Chinese medicine. This herb here down on the bottom right is called Ramania, R-E-H-M-A-N-N-I-A, -N -N Ramania. And technically, that's your number one longevity herb in Chinese medicine, which virtually nobody knows about in the West. It's easy to find down at Chinatown. It's, it's a prepared herb, right? And this is easy to make this uh, lovely coffee-like uh, drink here. See here, with and that's red date, so they sweeten it and they're a, a blood tonic. And that's your Romania drink there. Sometimes I put like a touch of vanilla in that. And you see in longevity from a Taoist perspective, it's all about maintaining your jing or your inherited life force, right? Uh, your constitutional blueprint, so to speak. And also the seat of your longevity is the kidney chi in Chinese medicine. So we really, really look after our kidney chi for longevity. And this herb nourishes what we call the kidney yin. Uh, so, uh, and it's so I'm just demonstrating that these things are very accessible, very easy to do, <laughs> really tasty. And you can start to uh, integrate, you know, a, a few of these ideas from today's uh, talk, hopefully. That's what it's all about, is to get you excited, get you inspired, get you started uh, on this uh, journey. Now, uh, it's not working, but there we go. So, yes. Um, I draw on traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic, cultures of longevity, and we also have a module where we start to explore the Western nutritional breakthroughs, because I always say that Western nutrition has gone through a, uh, a renaissance. It was, in my opinion, a little bit boring up to very, very recently, and now they're spending uh, uh, billions on uh, anti-aging uh, uh, biochemistry. And so there's a lot of research happening, you know, around the telomeres and the mitochondria and so forth. So there's some interesting uh, supplements that are starting to come out. So this curriculum is not so much about supplements. Sometimes when you do Western nutritional theory, it's a lot of supplements involved and a lot of chemistry, et cetera. But we do integrate it because there are some very good supplements around for, you know, uh, blood chemistry, brain chemistry, uh, and also some cutting edge uh, aspects like the telomeres and et cetera. Uh, so I can always take questions about that later. I'm, I'm not gonna be covering that uh, in this presentation this evening because of the time, but just to let you know that this is an East and West perspective. So what is natural healing? Well, fundamentally, it's about really starting to get a re great relationship with food and, uh, in my opinion, you know, really starting to uh, incorporate some home cooking again. A lot of people just eat out all the time. And, and that makes you very, very vulnerable to, you know, the qualities of food, you know, commercial food. Uh, a lot of people are just uh, eating a lot of uh, takeaway foods now. Young people don't even uh, cook at home, you know. Uh, so, you know, it's about taking control of your health again. So I've, 
diet is definitely a fundamental place to start. Right? But of course, it's a holistic approach. You know, you've got to consider exercise and movement and breathing. Uh, uh, I think it's very, very important to get some knowledge about tonic herbal medicine, which has been around for thousands of years, very easy to tap into. Of course, um, fasting has always been uh, uh, a way of accelerating your healing and recalibrating yourself very, very quickly. Uh, we don't get into any extremes at all in this uh, curriculum. And there's ways of just integrating small amounts of fast, like a 24-hour fast. Uh, sometimes fasting can do damage. Um, you have to be careful. If you're already deficient and you start to read about all these people doing intermittent fasting and you, you, you sort of get into too, too much fasting, you can, make your, you can make yourself even more deficient from a Chinese medicine perspective. So there's an art that you should learn around fasting. And of course, spring uh, springtime in the West is usually considered a good time for, for to do a two to three day fast, but we don't do that in Chinese medicine. We do it in the summertime when the yang, the warmth, yang energy is high and it's very easy to fast at that time. Whereas in springtime, there's a tendency to really nourish what we call the liver uh, and the wood energy with all the fresh new growth that's happening in nature. I can take questions later on about fasting, if you like. Supplements, I do think certain supplements are now becoming part of the protocol of longevity, absolutely. Uh, um, and of course, things like uh, meditation, self-reflection, I think is so important, especially around becoming your own doctor. See, we don't have the blame game in this curriculum and we always say there's no such thing as accidents you you can start to be uh, sort of tapping into these sort of messages of the universe that are coming to you right and including various uh, ailments and signs and symptoms that come up there is this way of uh, reflecting on that re-examining your lifestyle re-examining what you're eating etc to master life so of course, this is a, this is a mindset lifestyle uh, training and ultimately in the uh, self-mastery that the Taoism the has always had this strong attitude around self-mastery. But we've also had it a lot in our Western esoteric traditions. We've just kind of uh, forgotten about that. Rudolf Steiner was one of the great uh, philosophers of our time that re-energized that in the Western esoteric traditions. And then, of course, it's all about, you know, what lights you up? Uh, what, you know, what's your life purpose? What do you want to, what do you want to do? <laughs> and we call that uh, peak experiences. So important to follow your bliss, follow your dream. Uh, when you get uh, healthy and more clear, your intuition starts to work a lot better. You become a, 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 a much better antenna to receive all these subtle uh, energies of the universe and you start to your aura starts to sort of expand out naturally into how to look after the planet a bit better how to develop a, a personal ecology uh, etc so that's what i would call natural healing as mentioned i draw on these principles here um there's this fundamental difference between the you know, the Eastern holistic view and sort of Western medicine. I think we can uh, have a great modern medical system by joining these two, right? Which uh, a lot of uh, young doctors in America and uh, particularly in America, and it's called functional medicine. And they're sort of starting to, they're a lot more open to uh, Eastern medicines and yoga, et cetera. And they're studying uh Western medicine, and I, I I would often go to some of their meetings in uh, New York. And it's like two two three hundred uh, young uh, medical students there, <laughs> and they sort of get up and go, "Oh, I healed myself with doing yoga, or I healed myself with this diet, right?" And they're starting to re-examine the whole Western medical model, which is, as you know, it's pretty much about very much about. Uh, the pharmaceuticals very much about just treating the symptoms not looking at the root cause now eastern 
and holistic medicine is very, very good about looking at the root cause and relating that to diet and lifestyle and uh, that holistic approach. So in the West, as you know, people get, you know, uh, blood tests, they get uh, x-rays, uh, chemical analysis, rely on a lot of uh, specialists, etc. And that's all good. That's all good. But the Eastern view is like, it's about learning yin and yang, the five elements, the organ groups, the taste, the power of uh, food, uh, learning about how these environmental factors like cold and heat and damp can start to affect you. And ultimately, it's about self-mastery and self-reflection. So uh, quite radically different from the Western perspective for, uh, around uh, medicine. The longevity diet, I'm going to go into all of the food groups uh, in the next couple of slides, but just to give you uh, like an introduction, uh, our modern diet, particularly after the Second World War, has become very, uh, uh, you know, chemicalized, industrialized. Uh, the life force is taken out of these foods. We're no longer connected to our immediate sort of regional environmental energies right we're now eating completely out of season you know people in the the cold uh winter of uh england uh eating tropical fruits <laughs> which just doesn't make any sense guys it just doesn't make any sense so this curriculum is all about tapping into the way people used to eat uh during the winter what was available or what uh preparations they did etc so that it becomes more wholesome uh deep nutrition ancestral thinking ecological definitely uh, an emphasis on organic where possible and obviously unrefined so in a nutshell when you go shopping you really really want to think well i, I just need to get the raw components of food again I don't need all the processed foods. It's a simple, if you if you take just that simple principle when you go shopping, you can make a huge difference in your health, right? So, and yes, that does require a, a bit more skills around uh, understanding some cooking method methodologies, obviously, right? So, uh, and of course, this is a very seasonal, sustainable, centering, nutrient-dense is often... A, a term that we use, and of course, uh, from a uh, from a Taoist perspective, which is all about what we call non credo, and so that's uh, where I emphasise that there's no dogma in this curriculum. This is not vegan. This is not vegetarianism. Uh, we always say if you're vegan or vegetarian, you, if you do this curriculum, it, it's it's a lot better for you. We'll show you, you know, some of the, the fronts and backs of all of these things. We study all of the food groups. And then ultimately, students start to decide what they're going to work with. They start to understand their constitutional energies a lot better. Uh, they understand their uh, body types a lot better. And they can tap into that. So I think it's very, very important to have a a diverse diet where you get all of the nutrition that the human frame needs. So what do we do with the longevity diet? Well, we show people how to uh, consume uh, whole cereal grains, uh, what we call the staff of life. There's a lot of, um, you know, kind of phobia around carbohydrates now, as you might know, some of the modern diets are coming out and saying, oh, no, you shouldn't eat any uh complex carbohydrates uh which i think is uh a little bit foolish because uh when you examine cultures of longevity uh for the last several thousands of years so to speak there's always been wild grains and complex carbohydrates associated with all of these cultures of longevity but they knew how to prepare them they knew there's these traditional preparation methods where yes you nature has what's called the phytic acids these these ingredients that sort of keep the insects and the birds away and uh if you don't prepare these uh some of these food groups properly you can get irritation you can get some inflammation you can get some digestive uncomfort from that and that's <clears throat> So we're very much into using the, the sort of the traditional knowledge around 
these food groups. So whole grains, uh, you know, you need to soak overnight. It gets rid of the phytic acid. And, uh, you know, for instance, noodles are very quick to use. And there's some lovely high quality uh, noodles available now. Uh, but, you know, sometimes people have these sort of uh, issues around uh, uh, grain eating. We have a very, very um, simple principle of grains. It's best to just start off with a little bit in soup. Uh, you do need to have some digestive power there to uh, uh, digest grain energy. You just don't, if, if you're not, if you haven't been used to eating uh, some grains, then it's best to start off slowly and start to get that intestinal flora uh, stronger so you can digest. So that's a big subject. And we, we kind of cover it a lot in our cooking classes, you know, go through all those preparations, but definitely part of uh, grains and beans, uh, you, you know, all the B vitamins and the complex carbohydrates, this gives you a nice deep uh, nutritional um, resource in, in the body. So definitely part of a longevity diet. We don't cut that out. A lot of these modern trendy diets have cut that out. And <laughs> I just I can't believe, like some even cut out beans. And, you know, about two thirds of the population of this planet re re rely on beans for a good, you know, economical, nutritional protein source, right? So as long as you know how to, do these preparation methods are really really good and the thing about grains and beans nuts and seeds and vegetables are very much at the center of nutrition and then a little bit over here you have more yin foods over here you have a little bit more yang foods etc and uh you know we vary we can vary our vegetable selection with like the seasons what what's available you don't have to be too narrow minded about that. You know, I always, you know, I, I admit I, am, I eat avocados all year round, right? You know, so there's some flexibility there. But yes, you're ultimately wanting to get to that uh, farmer's market and get the fresh vegetables. Uh, and then what we call the spring and the summer months, uh, more yang season. That's where you lighten up your food. Uh, you have a little bit more raw food, et cetera, less cooking time. In the autumn, the winter, that's when the energy wants to go into the core of the body again. So that's where you might be doing a lot more, you know, uh, cooking preparations and using some fats and oils to really, really warm up that food. And you get start to get those warming herbs in there because that's what you need when it's snowing outside. Sea vegetables, I highly recommend to everybody that you start to examine that. It's easy to do. Uh, just get your kombu, if it's a good place to start, readily available from just about every health food store on the planet now. And you can just uh, simmer that, and that's uh, making a great minerally rich stock. I always say the secret to longevity is in the stock. And for instance, the longest living people uh, out of those um, uh dozen or so cultures that we actually study in this curriculum the were the actual from uh, okinawa in japan and i always say what we have to do guys is look at okay what were they eating in some of their uh patterns of eating and now we just have to put that into our modern life you know when we're living in new york and london etc and so when you study the cultures of longevity oak from okinawa they were a fish eating tribe and they would get the seaweed and they would get uh, a, a broth from the bones of the fish, high in minerals and high in what we call jing, the life force. The life force of an animal is very much in the bones and the bone marrow. Right? So they would make a bone broth. They would have a strip of kombu in there that's got the uh, 103 trace minerals that your immune system needs to operate well on, right? So you've made a really, really powerful stock there. And then that stock goes into your porridge, into your soup, into your vegetable dishes, into your, et cetera, get the idea. So that's uh, a really good place to start with longevity is just starting to make a really good uh, stock or a really good broth. Um, for instance, a bone broth. Uh, I've been teaching bone broths for 40 years, and they're starting to become a little bit more mainstream now. People have discovered that they're really good for uh, reducing inflammation of the digestive tract, great way of getting collagen, uh, good, uh, good for the skin, etc. So uh, 
we, wild fish, uh, the grass fed um, uh, uh, meats that you can now get wild pastured, right? You know, you might have to hunt around for that, so to speak, right? But uh, essentially, there were there was no cultures of longevity that were vegetarian, right? They just it just didn't happen. We we those cultures ate from all of the food groups, and of course, from Chinese medicine, the uh, yang energy, warming, and blood building, and jing that you get from uh, animal foods is quite important, but you don't have to eat much. And there's lovely ways of balancing out yang food with yin food. So the way that we like to um, emphasize with uh, meat eating is to put it like our ancestors did in Europe. Uh, they put it into soup first. So a little bit of meat on a bone in with some barley and vegetables, right? It's a wonderful way of having the right amount of uh, nutrition that you can get from uh, animal food. So it's a great way of balancing all of that out. So tonic soups, um, the uh, uh, now raw dairy, uh, unpasteurized, uh, we've been part of this movement to get real food back on the planet again, right? Uh, so my father grew up with 14 other kids in a farm in New Zealand. They all didn't, none of them died of degenerative disease. They just kind of dropped off the planet one day. And you asked, well, what, what were you guys um, eating? So they had raw milk. So un, when you start to heat that milk up, you first of all, you knock out all the enzymes that nature has put in there for you to digest that milk. And you also harden the protein called casein. And that's very, very hard on the liver. So I would say to you guys, just forget about modern dairy food. It's quite toxic, right? But you can start to seek out these traditional preparations around raw and unpasteurized, right? So that's really what you've got to get to. And it's a, it's a developing cottage industry. Uh, often you have to go directly to the farmer to get that. You can't get it in the stores anymore, right? But that's definitely part of uh, the longevity diet, high quality dairy food if you want it. And in Chinese medicine, that's a great way of building up your gene, building up the fluids, the moisture, the lubrication, uh, very good for sleeping problems, all sorts of things, right? Of course, nuts and seeds soaked and sometimes uh uh, roasted um, to make them a lot more digestible, very, very nutrient dense. So just a sprinkling uh, in a salad over the porridge, etc. Now, fats and oils, there's been a lot of mischief in the modern world about uh, fats and oils, the so-called low fat diet, which has no clinical basis to it whatsoever. And if you want to discuss that with me later, I'm more than happy to discuss that one. Uh, so what we want to do is return to our traditional fats and oils that our ancestors were using and pretty much avoid those modern uh, 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 vegetable oils. Very, very important because the vegetable oils go rancid very quickly. They, um, they acidify very, very quickly in the body. They create a lot of free radicals uh, in the body and, and uh, pretty much, in my opinion, vegetable oils, high sugar consumption, chemicals in the food, things like microwave cooking. Uh, that's where a lot of degenerative disease has come from. So I'm going to be talking about the oils that uh, we use further down this track. So hang in there. Uh, I'll cover that. But I'm just making the, the point. You know, a lot of people say, oh, eat uh, more fruit, right? But in from a Chinese medicine perspective, fruit is... Uh, very yin, very cooling. If you've got cold hands and cold feet, fruit is not your uh, uh, recipe for healing uh, because of its yin nature. So our emphasis is to have a little bit more fruit when it's available naturally in the in the summertime. Our ancestors would only eat fruit in the summertime and then it disappeared. If you notice the fruit comes out for a couple of weeks on the tree, you grab it like crazy, you binge like crazy, yum, 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 and then it's gone. So, uh, you know, they weren't eating tropical fruits over the wintertime. Uh, it just didn't happen. Uh, and that's very, very appropriate from an energetic perspective. So I'd say to you, to uh, sometimes some people need to start to reduce their fruit uh, consumption because it also spikes the blood sugars. But of course, in the summertime, you can enjoy a bit more. You can balance the cooling effects of fruit by 
doing these traditional preparations like cooking and putting some like a, like an apple pie is a great winter preparation prepar preparation for for fruits you know because now you've got fire in there which is warming uh you've got the herbs you know like um so like cinnamon and and uh cloves etc to to warm it up and make it more digestible but of course the berries uh you know the berries you can get away with eating throughout the year they they are available <laughs> from the supermarket uh, readily available as you know and just very very high great nutrition and you just you, you know consuming small amounts now we're really into the herbs and spices um i met my mother's place so let me just turn that phone off uh, thanks tanya <laughs> uh so um Fermented foods, we're going to uh, get into here uh, a little bit. I'll show you some slides. Very, very important. Uh, used traditionally all over the world. Um, easy to integrate into your day-to-day -to -day life. I always say uh, it's not an apple a day that keeps the doctor away. It's a pickle a day that keeps the doctor away. You don't need too much fermented food, just a little bit every day. Good to have a diverse, you know, sometimes sauerkraut, some homemade pickles, sometimes some miso, et cetera. You know, it's good to have a, kind of like a very diverse um, fermented range. And then your microbiome, which everybody's talking about now, right? But of course, traditional uh, cultures uh, understood that very well. And then there's a great range of some herbal teas. Uh, and I'm gonna, later on, I'm going to talk about what we call spring dragon tea because that's technically the number one longevity tea on the planet. And I'll describe that further down the track uh, today. And good old uh, medicinal mushrooms. So we've just been through a global pandemic and we've been you know, warn warning people about superbugs for you know decades now, it's always gonna happen. And so you always need to create a intelligent and adaptive immune system, right? So it's not just strengthening the immune system, which we need to do with, you know, fermented foods, uh, minerally rich, enzyme rich foods, natural foods, avoiding uh, too much excess of alcohol and sugar, you know, a little bit of that from time to time, that, that's fine. It's just not, you don't want to overwhelm the body with that, right? So the thing about medicinal mushrooms like shaga and reishi, which have been used for thousands of years in Chinese medicine, they're incredibly strengthening to the immune system. But when you start to get into these herbs, they're intelligent. They're called ad ad adaptogens. They start to work with what your body needs and it, it sort of makes the immune system clever and ad adaptive. So, uh, Again, very easy to integrate. Uh, sometimes you can just use it as a supplement. It's a good place to start. You can get these uh, medicinal mushroom blends, uh, which are fine to start with. You know, it's an easy way to start to uh, uh, fine tune your immune system, which believe me, most modern people need to do. <laughs> so that's easy to do. Uh, but what we love to do in this curriculum is show people the old fashioned way which is a dying art, you know, uh, modern Chinese people don't even know it. Grandma had all that wisdom. Uh, modern Chinese people are drinking Coca-Cola and getting KFC. Whereas grandma used to know how to make some, you know, uh, broths with these uh, mushrooms, how to, how to integrate them into some dishes, et cetera. Or if you like, just get started with shiitake mushrooms, right? And, you know, saute, put them into soups, et cetera. Very, very important, guys, to think uh, the, the, the mushrooms. Now, of course, there's a whole range of superfoods coming out. What we do in our training is show people how to make these elixirs, how to kind of combine them into these lovely, uh, uh, tasty uh, drinks. And Rather than just talking about, oh, yes, it's full of magnesium and, uh, you know, it's an antioxidant. You know, what isn't an antioxidant in this day and age? But we look at, is it good for the jing? Is it, is it warming? Is it cooling? Is it good for the brain uh, shun or the spirit? Is it good for the heart chi? So we, we, we just integrate the energetics into these superfoods, right? And we've been on the, the spearhead uh, in the world 
showing people how they can start to use these amazing superfoods that are now coming into our, our Western culture. Here's some examples of uh, some of the foods. You might recognize the good old miso soup. And here's a, a, a porridge that's been soaked overnight, bottom right-hand corner, with uh, chia seeds and goji berries, uh, with a few of the berries there, and a big blob of butter. Like the way to stabilize your blood sugars and get all that vitamin D that you need and that vitamin E is in these using these fats because uh, they're called fat soluble vitamins. And the only way you can get that into the body is using them with fats. And if you take a porridge like that, believe me, you're happy for the next, you know, five to six, seven hours, especially if you start to sneak that high quality butter in there, right? So, uh, and then of course we do these lovely sort of fermented uh, drinks that you can see here. And so yin and yang is the way the universe works. And uh, in my humble opinion, you should study it. Night and day, man and woman, up and down. The it's the polarity of the universe. Uh, heaven and earth. So when we say heaven, it's not a religious term. It's cosmic chi. And our human body, right down to the DNA, the mitochondria, is an incredible antenna to receive this highly charged energy of the infinite universe that we live in, right? So that's what we call the Yang uh, cosmic chi. And then we have the earth chi, good old mother earth resonating with us as well. And that becomes your yang meridians, it becomes your yin meridians, and then it becomes your yang organs and your yin organs, right? So it's a big picture, it's a great way of tapping into how, how this amazing universe works. And it gives you clarity. It becomes like a little compass that you can start to use in your uh, practical day-to-day uh, -day rituals, right? So of course we get into that uh, but I, uh, in the curriculum, but I can only but encourage you to start reading up about it uh, and uh, start to get a sense of it. It's in, basically, it's information. It, 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 that's all it is. Oh, that's yin energy or that's yang energy. It's, it gives us more infinite information to be able to discriminate and make decisions and, and start to tune into things that make more harmony and balance. The study of all of this is harmony and balance. And that, they're not um, casual words for us. <laughs> that's something that you study for the rest of your life is harmony and balance. <laughs> and uh, we also use the five elements where it's this incredible. Um, framework of body mind and spirit so the uh for instance negative emotions are embedded in these uh organ patterns where there's deficiencies or excess so when the liver gets hot uh that's what we call anger uh when the uh, spleen energy which is the earth energy gets deficient that's what we call digestive syndrome or poor digestion and malnourishment etc so we go through uh, the five elements. Uh, as I said, it's, it's a, a, a scientific way of looking at this mind, body, and spirit connection. And it connects us with food groups, cooking styles, flavors, seasons, uh, body types, and emotions. Uh, so it's a wonderful study, uh, easy to study. It's not uh, complicated. Um, so, uh, that's part. So in food energetics, we have, we look at it in terms of, uh, the character of the food, what we call the doctrine of signatures. So every kind of, uh, herb and food or animal type has, has a, has a character to it and has a kind of a, a definite sort, sort of functioning. So when we eat that, we, that helps us with that particular type of functioning where it has a yin and yang component it has a temperature is it warming is it cooling and it also has a five element is it good for the liver is it good for the spleen uh, etc very very important five elements pervades everything in Taoist thinking right your acupuncture points are made up of uh, five elements um, etc things like uh, the temperatures of foods, we have this concept where there's like a normal, like room temperature, then some foods are more warming, 
like basil and ginger and garlic. Some foods more hot, like chili. And then some foods are cooling, like mint tea. You know, so a hot summer day, day you don't want the ginger tea. You, you had that in the winter time when you got some, you know, cold hands. Now it's it's hot, so you want a peppermint tea, a mint tea. It cools you down. So when you get to know these energetics, you can survive in any climate, right? You'll know how to eat when you go to the uh, Arctic Circle, right? You'll know what to eat when you go to uh, a tropical country, right? And how to make that balance by knowing these uh, energetics. So that's a very direct uh, experience is the temperatures of food. People do this intuitively, of course. You know, they crave certain uh, foods because of that warmth or that cooling uh, nature. A very, very important aspect of food energetics. Uh, eating with the seasons. When we eat with the seasons, we start to strengthen the five elements, which strengthens your organ groups, which strengthens those emotions and psychological attributes. Right? So uh, it's very, very uh, connected with healing. Here's an example of some, you know, how we vary our cooking styles. But one of the consistent ones throughout the seasons is soups and broths. And <clears throat> that's called the earth element. And that's just a, it's just a, uh, an idea of making foods very, very digestible so that you can build up chi and blood, right? And that's called the school of the stomach and spleen, which is this earth element in the Taoist tradition which is a 6,000 year old tradition. They trace all of the signs and symptoms and disease processes back to your uh, functioning of your digestive energy. This ability to transform food and drink into blood and chi. So we talk about how we really like to keep that transformative energy or what some cultures call, like if you go to India, they call it your digestive fire. Right. So that's why we have a tendency to avoid an excess of cold foods, an excess of things like ice cream, which is incredibly cold, frozen, damaged, very damaging to the uh, stomach uh, fire. That's why we like uh, warm teas, uh, even on a summer stay, you know, to avoid uh, 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 iced, ice cold teas, things like that, because of this concept. And one of the most digestive things that you can do, especially for convalescent, convalescent, uh, convalescent, <laughs> convalescent, is um, uh, soups and broths. And that's always a good place to start with getting onto the longevity diet. Easy to do uh, uh, in any season, right? And of course, you can have more longer term soups in the autumn and the winter, more longer and more root vegetables, maybe using a bit more animal food. Then in the springtime, less animal food, maybe more cooling things like fish, which is a lot, lot better in the summertime. But fish doesn't have a thermal temperature that you might need in the wintertime. So that's the way you start to get to know this. But the, the soups and the broths are just a great way of getting that digestive energy back again. Right? Then, uh, we, yes, uh, the bone broths, we really start to encourage. now. Uh, down here is uh, some fats, right? So uh, if you're vegetarian, uh, the uh, coconut oil is a good place to uh, start. And of course, the olive oil, right? And to a degree, uh, we do recommend avocado oil these days because of the high uh, thermal temperature it reaches without breaking down. So if you're doing like a stir fry, like you're stirring some fish or vegetables, it can be quite good. Uh, coconut is very, very good, but sometimes you don't want that flavor. So olive oil and sesame oil are these sort of uh, wonderful traditional foods. Then, of course, ghee is a fantastic, uh, you know, if you're more kind of vegetarian and you don't want to go to the uh, animal fats, then uh, I highly recommend that you use uh, butter and ghee into your cooking. And, as you'll see in some of these other slides, it's the only way we can get these sort of fat-soluble vitamins into us, like vitamin D and uh, A uh, and E, et cetera. Right? So highly recommend that. And we are also into all the traditional fats that kept our ancestors strong. Tallow and lard 
uh, etc. They're stable fats. Uh, they uh, uh, they um, stabilize your blood sugar. Uh, they satisfy you very, very well. They build up the jing of the body, which is the hormonal energy, right? And very, very important for longevity. So there's an emphasis in this curriculum to get back to those traditional fats and oils big time. We use things like uh, Asian herbs. You've probably heard of things like ginseng, which is very good for the yang energy of the body. So things like fatigue or cold hands, cold feet, ginseng is very, very good. Now this Ho Shu Wu, um, that's another uh, herb that you can put into the same uh, uh, category as the herb that I introduced you to in, at the beginning of this slide presentation, the Romania. Remember, Romania is very, very good for the kidney yin of the body. It's a major longevity uh, herb. Now, Hoshu Wu, you can get as a supplement. It's very good for darkening your hair, strengthening your bones, uh, and strengthening the kidney energy. And it's uh, made from just a very uh, basic shrub, right? And it's not uh, expensive. Uh, so uh, you can Google that. You can find that uh, as a supplement, you can go down to Chinatown, you can buy it as a supplement, along with Romani, it's very, very good for uh, the kidney chi. And of course, we use um, various Western herbs, and we have a whole module based on the Ayurvedic training as well, you know, where we get into all these amazing uh, herbs and, and supplements. Mm -hmm. And then the medicinal mushrooms, I've started to mention how important they are. Here's a bit of a list of some of the ones that we, we get into mainly. Here's some of our student creations. So down here, are some of the uh, lexas that I was talking about, how you can get these sort of superfoods now into your broths and teas. And here's uh, kefir, you know, one of the traditional um, fermented foods of uh, Eastern uh, Europe. Wonderful, very, very wonderful um, uh, fermented food for the microbiome, for, for digestive problems, for getting rid of inflammation from the digestive tract, et cetera. And uh, this fellow down here is Nam Singh. And we have a module of how you can integrate the Chinese culinary herbs into your cooking. So uh, for instance, we have over 360 herbs in herbalism. But in the culinary arts, you only need to know three or four, right? Or if you like, you know, five to 10, up to you. But it's easy to get to know some of these herbs and how to start to use them for teas and broths and porridges, uh, et cetera. So we have a whole module based on cooking with the Chinese herbs, which is, it, it just sort of takes your dietary preparations to the next quantum level when you start to get into the herbs. Very, very important for for health and longevity, in my opinion. So this is Nam Singh. Um, some more student creations here, as you can see, really colorful. These are all student creations, by the way, that they, they do. So what is Jing? Jing is the, this fundamental energy. Uh, it's, called, it's part of what we call the three treasures in Taoist uh, energetics. So the uh, Tan Dian, or the hara just around your belly button, which is what you strengthen in yoga and martial arts. Mm -hmm. That's the seat of your vitality and it's the seat of the kidney energy and the kidney energy holds and maintains the jing energy. So it's, a, it's sort of like the number one idea around longevity and vitality, right? And to have youthfulness in your older age, right? So, and there's lots of things that destroy your jing. There's the modern... Uh, diet full of chemicals and you know hard mixtures and demineralized and uh, and, and uh, not very digestible and uh, and so forth and then there's some foods that are really really good to help to build up your gene so pretty much the longevity diet is very much about just you know maintaining and building up that gin quality right? so obviously things like stress and loud music and drugs and excess sugar and alcohol and excess uh, of course pharma you know the side effects of pharmaceuticals you know draw out all the gin the life force from you so very very important concept 
So depletion of your reserve, overwork, overexercising, stimulants, drugs, etc. That's uh, your jing. Okay, I better keep moving through here. Uh, so there's, again, these are some of the things that you can study in Chinese medicine that gives you this idea of how to maintain the body's energy. We have this idea of chi and blood, which are, so chi, chi is the life force, the sort of more, the, like my voice is more yang, right? It's vibrational. Whereas the, the substance, the physical world is more yin, and that's made up of blood and moisture and, and, and jing, et cetera. The shun is more like your mental functioning, uh, your mental clarity and your spirit and your consciousness. So that's called the Shun. So the three treasures makes up this wonderful sort of energetic understanding of the human uh, predicament. So we have some foods that are very good for building blood. We have some foods that we call uh, spirit food. For instance, the, the, all of the mushrooms are considered a spirit food. They work really, really well on your uh, nervous system. Right? Uh, and very, very good for the brain chemistry, et cetera. Uh, then things that build your blood are like, it's like a good soup, right? <laughs> and then things that build your kidney energy are things like the seaweeds uh, that, that build your gene and some of these herbs that I've, I've mentioned. Uh, we get into self-diagnosis by exploring how cold affects the body, uh, this idea of too much activity or wind. Uh, heat can affect the body. Uh, dampness, congestion affects the spleen, uh, energy, and dryness starts to affect the lungs. So, uh, so it, in my opinion, it only takes a weekend. We we have a weekend in our training called health assessment, and these are the tools that we use in Chinese medicine. You know, if you're a herbalist, acupuncturist, etc. But the lay person can uh, learn this in a weekend. Uh, and start to apply it straight away into their day-to-day -day life to start to be your own doctor. So there are some skills required to uh, uh, be your own doctor. And this is uh, part of the training here. Now, let's look at cultures of longevity. Uh, in the 1930s, Weston Price with his wife uh, traveled to over a dozen cultures all over the world. Uh, they documented it. He documented it in his book uh, that he wrote in the 1930s, uh, uh, Nourishment and Degenerative Disease, it's called. Uh, it's a fantastic book, and this influenced me 40 years ago. Uh, you just needed to read this book to figure out, you know, how we need to really get back to some ancestral eating, some ancestral wisdom, uh, get back to our traditional uh, foods and get back to our traditional fats and oils. Very, very important. So I'm only going to sort of study uh, because of time con constraints, but to give you an idea, this is a little village in the mountains of Switzerland that was a little bit hard to get to, right? It was an off the beaten track. There was no roads in there. You had to sort of go over this track to get there. And they lived there for, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And they had uh, wonderful, they had no degenerative disease. He was a dentist, so he was pretty obsessed with studying people's uh, teeth, right? He was very scientific in his observations and his writings. He documented things really, really well. Now, what this person is holding here is actually a loaf of sourdough bread, right? So this village, would they would get organic grain, they would mill it fresh, right? Uh, which is the way to make uh, grain it's a, when you start to break the grain down it oxidates very very quickly so you always want to sort of mill it fresh and then they their sourdough starter and guess what they would only make this bread they had special houses to store it they only made it twice a year so that sourdough bread would break down all the enzymes, uh, the gluten, it's a high quality gluten that breaks it all down. So you don't have any problems with, you know, this whole thing around gluten. So they, and they had high quality dairy food. So the cows were eating, they would make the butter and their cheeses out of the spring grass. 
where the uh, nutrition in the spring grass was, it's just amazing, right? Uh, and they had uh, vegetables, fresh vegetables. And of course, the men from time to time would be able to hunt for some wild pig and, and deer, etc. So this village was never um, contaminated with tuberculosis, which at that time of the study was all over Switzerland. Right, you know, because of the modern influence, modern diet, sugar, uh, etc., they never had that uh, problem in this village. Right? So again, it gives you an idea how traditional foods were used, you know, for strengthening uh, and uh, avoiding all sorts of uh, degenerative disease problems. Uh, Roger, so, Roger, yes. Roger, Gina, I just want to uh, chip in. It's it's coming up to ten past eight. And I know you have a, a, a lot and we have questions. So I'm just uh, doing a time alert. Yep, good. So I've got, what, another 10 minutes? Yeah, another 10 minutes yeah. and we'll take questions, yeah. And then we'll take questions. That's good with okay. me, Gina. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. 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 So as I said, he documented this very well. And so I, I don't know if you've noticed, but if you look at movies from the 1930s and the 40s and if you look at those old guys you know at veterans day walking down the street you know they had they people look different uh to modern people the there's uh, a more narrow jaw crowded teeth uh teeth problems and uh, you can start to notice this with people who had a traditional diet and then people who are now uh through gestation etc uh, with the more modern diet. So it's, this is uh, very well documented with Western Price's material. So because of time, uh, we'll sort of skip over that. But of course, what did he notice? That these cultures of longevity had no processed foods. Any kind of processing was done in a natural way. They used animal foods and fermented foods, dairy foods, depending on where you lived, right? And everything was nutrient dense, high levels of vitamins and, and minerals. So yes, these are the sort of things that we avoid uh, in the long, all these processed foods where emphasis is on traditional foods where there's high minerals and the fat soluble A and D, right? <clears throat> so uh, again, example of modern children with dental problems, crowded teeth, um, this is the way your vegetable oils are done, guys. It's... <laughs> Quite an interesting study uh, because of time will kind of keep moving. So these are the sort of things that we avoid like the plague um, in the longevity diet, including good old Paul down the bottom there. He, he had his heart in the right place, but didn't really have his uh, nutrition correct, in my opinion. <clears throat> so what are we after? We're after these traditional fats and oils where you can get that. I See, you can only get so much vitamin D from the sun, guys. Uh, that's well proven. You you need to get it sort of nutritionally, right? So, uh, you know, cod liver oil and uh, very important vitamin D, shellfish, lard, butter, eggs, grass-fed animals. Modern people are so deficient in vitamin A and D and, and so forth. As you might have come across in the recent pandemic, you know, the information circulating around that, boy, people are really deficient in, in uh, vitamin D and, and A, et cetera, and your immune system needs that, right? And people aren't eating these traditional foods anymore, and they're scared of fats, and there's no need to be scared of it. So this is where it comes from. This is what our ancestors were using. And vitamin K is also uh, modern people are very, very deficient. So for instance, Aboriginal people in Australia, one of the um, principal foods that they uh, enjoyed the most was emu. And emu has the highest concentration of vitamin K in it. Uh, I recommend sometimes for people who are starting to you know, want to recover from osteoporosis and uh, uh, fatigue, etc., to get um, not the vitamin K that you can get just as a basic supplement, like a synthesized chemical. It, it's just not bioavailable. You really want to get some things like some uh, 
emu oil supplements, which you can find over the internet. Or you can get it from high quality dairy food and some high quality uh, <clears throat> fermented foods. And he called that the missing link, vitamin K, that Western people were very extremely uh, deficient in it. And traditional people weren't. <clears throat> Okay, very, very important, vitamin A for you know proper growth and prevention of birth defects and functioning of the glands and vitamin D for healthy bones and reproductive energy and the cell functioning, et cetera. <clears throat> and essentially you need to get it from a dietary source as well. Right? It's just not enough from the sun. And so this is where some of these traditional foods come back in, the, the deep sort of jing nourishment that you get from it that traditional people used all the time. And there was a time, you know, during pregnancy where they really used these nutrient dense sacred foods a lot because they knew that they could create very strong constitutions uh, in their children. <clears throat> so there's some issues around how to get uh, vitamin A, uh, you know, uh, some people, think that they can just get it from a vegetable source, but this is a very, very controversial area. Some of you might be aware of it. Um, so I'm running out of time here, but I'd just like to say that saturated fats are vitally important to incorporate again. You can just use it in small amounts, right? Then every cell in your body is made up of saturated fats, not polyunsaturated, saturated fats, right? And vitally important for all the functioning of, of the body. So this is what this is what we call the sort of ancestral eating aspect of this, right? Uh, longevity diet. And uh, again, I emphasize: please get off those vegetable oils. Get back to those traditional oils. Um, avoid the uh, canola, soy, uh, corn. You know, but there's a big long list there. Avoid it like the plague. <clears throat> so I'm running out of time, but there's a lot of uh, diseases associated with trans fats, as you might know. Um, pasteurization, big issue there. Um, we're really into natural foods, uh, unpasteurized, etc. There's a lot of good documentation around this, how healthy it is. Um, for those who want to do a more academic study, there's lots of resources there. This is our team, uh, the teachers uh, up the top there, and we have a whole uh, mentoring supportive uh, team uh, to take you on this one year journey. It's 10 modules spaced over 10 months, and it's pretty much starting again in April. Uh, this gives you an idea of the scheduling. It's one module a month, so it's at a good pace, and it alternates between theory and philosophy uh, and practical classes. So this is uh, my first module, Introduction to the Energetics, and then you do a cooking class uh, with Inga. Uh, it's all done online now, and we've had a lot of success with that. Um, she, she's got a wonderful kitchen. She lives in Iceland. Uh, I do a health assessment weekend. <clears throat> I do a barefoot doctor, compresses, some exercises, some acupressure, some uh, uh, home remedies. Uh, we do the Alexas and superfoods. <clears throat> this is the uh, very interesting cutting edge supplements and longevity protocols uh, that you need to really kind of get that 120 plus going so I cover that in that module cooking with the culinary herbs with Nam Singh and now Ayurvedic training Letha is a well-known uh, um, author she did the Asian health secrets as, as a bestseller <clears throat> and we do a business training because the, it is a professional training with uh, helping people to transition off that um, industrialized western diet into what we call the guidelines and principles of the longevity diet so it, uh, we train our students uh, career-wise as well but obviously everybody is there for their self-healing and <clears throat> to develop their consciousness so i'm coming to the end uh of our presentation uh, roger uh, roger yes. you prepared a good, great presentation have a lot of details do you think you might make it available to us 
Uh, yeah, sure. It's sort of because available on. It's available on the film here. Yeah, but you, uh, we we can whiz through some of the pages so that then people can. Yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, I can uh, send you this presentation. Yeah. Right. Is okay. that, is that, yeah, no problem. Because it's a uh, great, you know, a lot of detail, great study. Um, yeah. So you know, uh, students get into all sorts of amazing uh, career. Uh, <clears throat> And of course, uh, lots of great workbooks, um, mentoring. <clears throat> well, the, okay, the, yes, Gina, pretty much, pretty, yeah, we can do, we can do some, this is the summer, I'll just finish here, this okay. is the summer retreat coming up in July next year, up at uh, uh, Skipton, Yorkshire, where Gina lives, this is a uh, uh, wonderful retreat center. So we're going to get all of our teachers there and um, put on a, a wonderful week of um, cooking classes, understanding, you know, the energetics, doing advanced uh, uh, longevity protocols. Um, and also we have the Therify there, the inventor, Paul Harris, uh, and all sorts of fun activities. You can join the, the way to keep in touch with us, guys, is to go to academyhealingnutrition.uk and just join the data the you know the newsletter we have a really good newsletter that we put out um every month you know some good health points some recipes uh etc so i'm going to stop sharing my screen there and we can come back to yeah i mean what what, what you do roger is you share each season the reminders of what we should be eating and recipes and i found that really useful um, yeah, the the yeah. If you get onto the newsletter, then you'll you'll find that we actually put on these free uh, seasonal webinars with all of our uh, teachers, and they co Inga covers some really amazing material, and you know these other other um, presentations we do, all free and very informative. So it's a great way of tuning in. Brilliant. So I'm going to throw out a few questions, Roger. Um, um... A question about seaweed, where do you get it? I mean, you know, health food stores and uh, you can go to Chinatown. But what about... Did you, say sea, did you say seaweed? I did say seaweed because I'm thinking... Yeah, the, the main thing there is you can pretty much find it in the health food stores rather than Chinatown because the, the health food stores have a very high quality seaweed that they get from very well established companies, you know, uh, and whereas in Chinatown, sometimes it's a little bit more, you can, you can get a good deal, it's a little bit cheaper, but sometimes the quality of it is not so fantastic. So readily available in every, every health st store that I walk into in this modern age, it's got some seaweed. You'll get wakame, kombu, yeah. uh, at least there, yeah. Yeah, because I was thinking from a sea pollution point of view. Um, what about cholesterol as a measurement in our Western metrics and handling that? You want to make a comment about? That? Yeah, so we need cholesterol, as you probably know, and the the liver produces cholesterol, and it goes into the uh, blood system for healing. It, it sort of patches up all of the broken uh, cells and any irritation around the arteries from acid and sugar, you know, the cholesterol comes along there and, and heals it. So it's vitally important. And what's dangerous is low cholesterol, <laughs> in my opinion, right? Now, high cholesterol, uh, in my opinion, is very, very, it's, A, it's not, nothing to freak out about, uh, and B, it's relatively easy to get on top of that with the longevity diet, getting some more vegetables in there, bitter foods. Uh, there's some good clearing agents that you can uh, use in herbalism. Uh, but this whole thing that, oh, if I eat fat, I'm going to get fat. If I eat cholesterol, I'm going to get more cholesterol. It, it, there's no clinical evidence for that. You, we need to break that down and start again. Right? So don't use the vegetable oils because they're very damaging to the arteries. They're very acidifying, creating a lot of free radicals. And then the cholesterol has to come in there and manage it, right? And you, yes, it can over 
work it and it can collect, you know. So get rid of those vegetable oils, get rid of the excess sugar, which creates a lot of acid, get rid of the alcohol for a bit for, you know, and then get it back to just having a little drink every four or five days or something, you know, because it just builds up too much acid in the body and that's going to trigger the overreaction of the cholesterol. So don't think cholesterol is the bad guy. It's the good guy. It's doing all the healing, all the correcting, all the damage, right? So, so if you get on... Yeah, Karen. I was just going to say, yeah. Roger, what you're saying is it's the wrong kind of measurement we're using. Well, it is a measurement that you have to be aware of. Uh, what I'm saying is it's relatively easy to manage and correct and uh, do it naturally rather than the you know, the, uh, I can't comment on, <laughs> you know, what I'm about to say, but uh, it's very easy to uh, manage naturally uh, high cholesterol. You can get a good result in three to four weeks, right? Okay. If not sooner, right? Okay. And, uh, but keep using those, even though you might have, keep using those fats and oils that I mentioned, because they're actually really, really healing for the body. Good fats and oils. Uh, what about um, arthritis? Questions asked. I'm not sure how short an answer. It can it's be. called a it's called a cold disease in uh, Chinese medicine, and again, it's inflammation of the joints, etc. So, uh, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of information that's just inflammation is the basis to all degenerative disease. Right. So the way you can approach this is 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 not to, don't get too complicated with natural here. Sometimes you just have to get it out of the way. Start with some of these things that I've been recommending, right? Because that's an anti-inflammatory diet I just took you through, right? And it, your body will naturally start to get rid of the inflammation by using a, a number of those foods and cooking styles that I've already mentioned, right? And then uh, there are some good herbs you could always go to. Once you get established with a good uh, healthy diet, then Herbal remedies even have a stronger effect on that. Uh, in a nutshell, avoid with arthritis, it's very, very important to avoid uh, cold, damaging foods, cold drinks. Ice cream is like the worst thing for arthritis, right? Uh, so think broths, warm. Think uh, bone broths, very, very good for arthritis. And think uh, ginger and garlic and basil, uh, all those lovely warming herbs, cumin, very, very good for arthritis, anti-inflammatory, et cetera. Brilliant. Menopause. And then everything and everything else I mentioned, get into it. All of that, yeah. They're all simple stages, aren't they? There's nothing dramatic um, necessarily. Peanut yeah. butter, peanut butter. So somebody asked me a question about peanut butter. Well, Is it people, good or pe bad? people crave people who are on the low fat diet, right? They they go to the peanut butter jar and, and, and consume half of it <laughs> because the body is saying, give me fats, give me fats. And and so when you incorporate these healthy fats again, you're not going to binge like crazy on peanut butter, right? And peanut butter, peanut, peanut's not the greatest uh, fat to get in. I mean, a little bit of peanut butter is fine, right? But uh, there's some other really good fats that uh, you can start to integrate, and you'll find that you you don't crave, you won't be binging. You mm. just eat, eat, and get on with life. And your cravings just it's good to follow your cravings. You know, we that's a very important. Uh, if if you're craving peanut butter, then you should start to use some ghee uh, and some lard, uh, and just get back and some more olive oil, and get back uh, back into using some fats and oils in your day-to-day prep -day preparations. And then you'll find that uh, you don't crave uh, a, a jar of peanut butter anymore. Um, Crohn's disease, is that something you can comment on? Yeah, but again, it's inflammation of the uh, intestine. One of the best things, apart from everything else that you can use that I just mentioned, is the bone broth. It is just so amazingly healing for the intestinal tract and getting rid of all that inflammation, right? Uh, so, and take it, you know, uh, three or four times a day, you know? So you get off the coffee and the black tea and the sugary things and inflammatory things that irritate the 
uh, small intestine and get into things like fermented foods and the miso soup and every day have uh, some bone broth and learn to make it yourself. Don't buy it from the super. You know what? A couple of hours on a Sunday, you can make enough bone broth to last you three weeks. You know, you make a big, get a slow cooker, put your bones in there, get some celery in there, get some kombu seaweed in there, make a big, big uh, cook it overnight and then uh, take half of it, put it in the freezer. You can thaw it out later and then take the other half, consume it that week just out of the fridge. Warm it up, of course. Put some garlic and ginger in it to revitalize it. But boy, uh, our students heal them. So we get a lot of, you know, students often have that. And within three to four months of our doing our uh, preparations, they're on top of it. Those symptoms are going away. They're, it's he they're healing their gut again. You know? So it's not complicated, right? Start there. Uh, I'm going to ask about menopause. Yeah, it's a time where you, the woman is going through the yin transformation. Woman, a more yin nature. Men are more yang nature. So women are very blood natured. And it's important to build building up blood uh, for them. So that's when the hormonal shift happens. So we have some great, Don Qua is called the woman's precious pill. And that's a very, very good time to have uh, Don Qua, which is a blood builder. And really stay away from alcohol. Uh, alcohol is heating. at that. When you don't have the right amount of yin, the heat, the yang takes off. That's where all the flushes come from. It's an underlying yin deficiency. So an alcohol and, and coffee and black tea kind of trigger that heat. And so do spices and chili trigger that heat. So you want to get back to those soups and broths, uh, et cetera. And then think uh, a, a little bit of animal food is very good, right, in the soup because it builds up the blood and it stabilizes the yin. Right? And it can take away a lot of the discomfort of menopause. Uh, if you've been eating this way for a couple of years leading up to menopause, that's going to be a very smooth transition for you. If you've been a little bit more chaotic and there isn't like a, a fluid way of being eating, like within the rhythm, et cetera, it can be a very extreme uh, time. So at least uh, think I got to build the yin up. I got to get some yin herbs, uh, perhaps even go to a Chinese doctor and get a a formula at the time if your symptoms are severe because those formulas are very directly uh they they they're quick acting and they can uh, help w get rid of a lot of those extreme symptoms um roger i've got some more questions and um, what i'm just going to say now is that if any are you if you're willing to stay on for a few more minutes after our formal ending um i'm just going to allow keep somebody keeps coming back in again i'm going to allow people to drift away if they choose and they've had everything and thank you for that but i'm going to say if you want to stay if you're okay to stay for a few more minutes roger are you oh i'm fine yeah okay Okay, but it's, it's, it's 8.30 and if people are planning to go to bed or whatever, then I was just going to say thank you. Thank you, Roger, on behalf of the people who are leaving. <laughs> and just to say, if you're leaving, join us again on Sunday when we have Jessica Adams for again, I think for a third or fourth time. And she's going to be talking about 2023. And Judy and I have spoken with her and heard some of the things she's predicting. And it's fantastic. So that's not to be missed. That's on Sunday morning. But so um, good night to anybody who wants to leave. But if you want to stay and ask some questions, and this is gold dust, folks, because we don't often have access to Roger, busy Roger. Um, and so if you have questions that I haven't covered and you want to ask him, we can do that now. And Judy, perhaps you put a link in for or the Sunday event as well uh, and there are more events but that's the, the one in the next few days um, yeah so I'm now going to continue I have a question uh, I asked you about menopause and I had a question come about eczema uh, it's a heat syndrome in Chinese medicine and very much uh, starts to uh, we trace it back to more like the liver chi the liver has this tendency to for heat and it sends out when you don't have the natural sort of elimination going on, the body's very clever. It sort of sends it out to the periphery to try to get rid of it. Uh, so again, when you start to eat more natural foods and the soups and the broths and digestion becomes a lot more smoother and 
getting a lot more vegetables into you, some fermented, raw, steamed, sauteed, right? Sneak those vegetables in. Uh, it really starts to alleviate uh, skin problems. Now, we also have a wonderful drink that's very good for eczema, and it's called Sazandra. Uh, maybe, Gina, you could put the spelling of that because you're it. familiar with that. Yeah. Wonderful. You can get it off the internet. Um, I did say I was going to mention that longevity tea. It's from dragonherbs.com, and it's called Spring Dragon Tea. And this is made of gynostema, which is a major tonic grass that we use in Chinese herbalism. And this has uh, over 120 saponins in it. And there's no other plant on this planet that has 120 saponins. So it's called spring dragon tea made of gynostema. So get that for your skin as well. And everybody should consider drinking this tea because the people who drank this tea in this region of China which they studied in the 1970s. They took a research group in there because this region of China, they were living 20 to 30 years longer than other people in China. And as you know, people in China did pretty well with longevity because they had a peasant diet. You know, they were eating from all the food groups and, you know, they weren't drinking Coca-Cola. And so uh, this group, this area, they, they discovered that they, because they were drinking this tea, this grass tea called gynostema or we modern term spring dragon tea um very good it's like washing the toxins away from the body and it uh, strengthens the membrane of the cells the mitochondria uh, modern cutting edge uh, supplements they get gynostema and get that very active ingredient out of it and sell it for you for 200 dollars a little <laughs> just drink the tea <laughs> Right, very good for eczema. So it's Sazandra and dragon, uh, spring dragon tea, very, very good for skin conditions. But again, when you get into that digestive energy again, making the get that efficient, the body builds up exactly what it needs, the right amount of chi and blood, right? Uh, get rid of those toxins and hard to digest foods and strange combinations, uh, which the liver struggles with. Uh, that's the way to get rid of your ultimately your, your skin problems uh and then it's what you you get into what we call the glow your complexion and your skin starts to have the sort of radiant uh health to it right? i've been asked about ibs roger similar uh gina uh to crohn's and digestive problems very very similar uh folks uh thousand and one signs and symptoms in our tradition, a trace back to your relationship with food. And those principles and guidelines that I've just taken you through is good for 1,001 symptoms. Somebody with cancer, diabetes, skin problems, Crohn's disease, IBS, you know, da, 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 the list goes on. Those guidelines and principles and those food groups and learning the, to cook again <laughs> will take you on a healing journey right? and of self-mastery. So uh, it applies to all of those signs and symptoms. So we don't need to complicate it. I, 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 it might sound too simple for the, the Western brain kind of goes, ah! <laughs> what can I say? Yeah. It's a school, the stomach and spleen, a 6,000 year tradition where it's just start to play with your diet, tweak it. Don't go into any extremes, get, new ingredients some experiment with some dishes and guess what healing starts to happen just get yourself out of the way is half the problem right healing happens because now you've made some new blood and with some life force in it and then that's what heals the body so think chi think prana think high quality think some beautiful nourishing dishes do that and it has radical effects right? don't complicate it don't just starts with going to the farmer's market and, and the health food store i know it's um challenging to change your diet which is why i've taught this course for 40 years i know it's challenging. you know we get the most highly motivated students and they pay serious money 
and we still have to mentor them for a whole year to for them to tune into this to make these changes because it, I know it's a very embedded habit that every human being has is their what how they eat what they buy what they spend their hard money on so but at the end of the day it is a very simple process that you can take control of and do yourself and my my words to you is don't complicate it just you can do it it's easy you know and start with uh food and drink because that's the most thing that you can control yeah a lot of things you just can't control yeah <laughs> that you can control and yeah. take and master and and uh, use effectively. Uh, more questions, Gina? You mentioned, you talked about eczema and psoriasis has come up. I don't know whether exactly the same that applies. So, speak to from our perspective, Chinese medicine and those teas, very, very similar uh, uh, heat tradition, uh, heat in liver and damp, damp heat, uh, etc. from Chinese medicine, yeah. Long COVID. Uh, it, it, it's, um, you know how I talked about medicinal mushrooms and how important they are to regulate and harmonize the immune system and to make it so get your shiitake mushrooms into your cooking uh, then start to use some of the medicinal mushroom blends and uh, start to use them to a degree in some herbal preparations so that's uh uh, a really good way of dealing with long-term immune deficiencies, et cetera. Okay. Somebody asked about zeolite. I don't know what it is. Zeolite. Zeolite. Yeah, it's good. All, all of that. It's good. Experiment with it. It's all good. Um, yeah. You know how you said about the quality of seaweed and uh, less Chinatown, more, you know, health food store what about lion's mane that you can buy as a supplement but you could also buy a whole lion's mane in the uh, chinese in chinatown because they have a big mushroom. yeah we we, we we're, we're, we're into buying the real food first yeah right yeah so lion's mane is amazing and you can get it fresh now in the store at the summer camp, by the way, in the UK, we're going to have a whole session on lines. We're going to get a whole lot of lines made in and we're going to cook it up for you and make various dishes. Absolutely. That's the way you really want to go back to, you know, remember that principle when you go shopping, buy things that aren't touched by humans to begin with, right? You'll save a lot of money and you'll, you'll heal yourself just with that principle. So we really like getting those original, the prana where it's all, together right and it's cheaper that way but you, yeah you've got to have a few skills to transform it into something appetizing and exciting to eat yeah so it's okay buying the dried lines then because that's how yeah yeah, oh, yeah i've never seen a, a live real one except the one i've grown i've never seen one out to buy in a shop but um yeah. i've been slicing it up and it's wonderful um yes yeah a lot of it will come dry in shiitake you come dry or fresh you know, yeah, lion's mane. You are starting to see it a lot more in the in the, in the oh, shops. Yeah. Uh, Certainly, shiitake mushrooms are sold in Tesco, which was astounding to me that their mushroom range has really widened. So, I mean, I did eat the occasional mushroom meal, and now it's mushrooms. Are you know, my kitchen is mushroom headquarters now. <laughs> <laughs> Got so much more. Well, folks, I, I I love your kitchen, Gina. I've been to kitchen uh, Gina's kitchen. And she makes the best buckwheat pancakes, I can tell you that. Well, thank you. And the winter version is it's the pancakes with broccoli leaves, because I've got a lot of broccoli out there. Less heads, but the whole plant's huge leaves, and I just eat those every morning. So have a green right. break. <laughs> so I think I'm coming to the end of the questions. If I haven't answered your question, stick it in there quickly, otherwise we'll, we'll, we'll run to the end. But I'm looking through. And unless I've missed something out for someone, I think we're pretty much there. I think people are saying, Roger, that very informative, best information they've had all year. I mean- it, Oh, thank it, it, you. Yeah. I mean, so my it, final, final words yeah. are support your local farmers, uh, your organic farmers, uh, support those wonderful cottage industries that you find at your local marketplaces. Because, you know, that, that cottage industry that's making some lovely chutneys and jams, the traditional way, uh, you know, so that's, that's a, 
tap into that rather than spending your money at the supermarket. So that's a good place to start. And you find all the fresh vegetables, the locally grown vegetables, right? Then remember stocks and broths, good place to start. And soups, really good place to start. And just think quality, think minerals, right? Uh, think enzymes, right? Uh, and think, think grandma's wisdom, right? Our ancestors from two to three generations ago. Uh, and some of those traditional dishes from England uh, are very, uh, you know, the, uh, I just like to say that sometimes the English diet gets bagged, right? But if you go back to those traditional dishes, that's what some of the most strengthening foods that you can uh, use, right? So there's a lot of great wisdom there that we've lost over the generations, you know? So it's time to revisit that and then put it into our modern age, you know, put it into our ecology, relate it back to our, you know, e economy and, and the local people who are uh, doing organic farming, et cetera, right? Good. It's just a good place to start. And in my opinion, you can rebuild the health of a nation just by doing that, really connecting with your local farmers, connecting with those ancestral foods again that aren't being transported all over the world and all of that jazz, you know. And it's fun. Get to know, you know, my, my challenge to you would be perhaps 30% of your food budget goes directly to your local environment if you can your local farmers find those organic farmers find those really amazing best eggs you know the chickens running around they're really healthy and not fed all the soy right find the pastured meats that local uh, farmers are doing all of that you got to do a bit of homework guys that's your challenge but that means you start to tap into and you, you rebuild the health of a nation by doing that one family at a time Wow, Roger, that's amazing. It, it is so simple. It's not complicated. Um, not complicated. I, I did. I put a note. Somebody was asking about the difference between fresh and dried herbs. I mean, you know, I suppose it's uh, fresh has its value while it's fresh, but the, the, the dried herbs don't, you know, still well, have potency, don't they? We we use both. Uh, the fact of the matter is, sometimes dried herbs can be more medicinal because you've yangized it. You know, you've intensified the chemistry of it so you, you be open to be using both and they have they have a different sort of energetic so fresh herbs wonderful and you should be growing some fresh herbs in, just outside your door there right uh, but the dried herbs very very good to be using as well yeah and is there any books that people should bring into their kitchen pantry um that would be good to start off with uh good question yeah okay um, there's a writer, Sally Fallon, F-A-L-L-O-N, Fallon, Sally Fallon, Nourishing Traditions. Uh, so that's to do with your ancestral eating, uh, integrating the work of long cultures of longevity, getting connected again with these traditional fats and oils and wisdom of our ancestors. That's a good one. Uh, any macrobiotic book is good for whole food cooking because at the end of the day, you need to become a bit of a whole food gourmet cook. Make sure this, don't uh, buy into their low fat carry on. It's uh, silly, but you know, it's, it's a good place to start. And if you want natural desserts, the macrobiotic cookbooks are very good for that. And to understand some of those healing foods like seaweeds and miso uh, is very good. So anything that's sort of whole food orientated plus ancestral eating orientated, uh, very, very good as a foundation to read <laughs> and to try those recipes. Uh, and of course, do the training, become a, become a, you know, a leader in your uh, environment, uh, local environment, you know, to help other people make this transition back to longevity and health and avoiding degenerative disease and rejuvenation of the human uh, frame. Well, even if you don't want to be a practitioner, just the, the depth of knowledge you can use for yourself and your family. It's um, all, it's 
Gina, it's actually all about it, the, the career thing is the secondary thing in that trade. It's all <laughs> about people understanding their own health uh, and how their family and children, their neighbors, but their, their own health problems usually to begin with. And then some, about half of the people do go on to use it uh, in terms of a uh, career, which is exciting, but it's all about developing. Here we are doing a talk at the Conscious Cafe. The training is about developing your consciousness. That's for everybody. That's the that's the fundamental thing that why we, we we do it. Yeah, your awareness, your sensitivity, your develop your intuition, uh, your empathy, your compassion. Tap into ecology. Tap into being an antenna for the infinite universe. You know. Yeah. Yeah, somebody's talking here about their making kimchi and kombucha. Great. I've started making my own cottage cheese, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> Having yeah. not done that for 30 years, I bought raw milk and I make my own cottage cheese. So <laughs> that was great. And a question about um, something as, as, uh, as severe and acute as kidney stones. Is it something that you can treat yourself? Or do you, you, you make, a, there are things you perhaps do to avoid them, but is, is it something that can only be dealt with by Western intervention or can you treat those yourself? Well, there's a place for that. And they have the laser treatment, which is quite effective. And, and you know, there's a, a place. I mean, our thing with this, it's, it's always good to start with food and herbs and exercise and home remedies and compresses and then acupuncture and massage and therapy. And then down the list there is Western medicine right? with surgery and incredible technology. But it, we sort of just put it, down the list but it's part of a holistic approach so uh you know you can uh, we have a the famous ginger compress which is this hot ginger towel that we put on the back of the kidneys which can help to pass kidney stones to a degree it can help uh kind of reducing any kind of pain uh ginger compresses are very very good for that um, readjusting your diet, getting into some of those uh, teas, the Sassandra tea, even the dragon spring dragon tea is very good for that. Following the dietary principles, <coughs> getting off those vegetable oils, uh, etc. Uh, and there are you could go to a Chinese herbalist to get a specific herbal remedy for your constitution and for that particular health problem. They're, they're very good at targeting herbs for that so you, you know but also the western treatment is, is is not too bad as you know for you know for kidney stones right? um, so somebody, something, to, something to consider you know okay and somebody said that they, they wished you could speak to us on television and speak to our health minister <laughs> they wish you were speaking on tv but this is this is you know we we learn this this is a, manager, it's we? not going to happen guys uh Welcome to a grassroots movement, and that's where our power is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, brilliant. Well, Roger, I think we're going to close. We're here at 10 to the hour, 10 to 9, and I have to say a, um, a huge thank you uh, because... Um, well, thanks, Judy. Thanks, uh, Gina. Uh, yeah, and you're doing wonderful work with your Conscious Cafe. Great concept. Yeah. Uh, the more we learn, talk, meet each other, the better this planet gets. So great meeting you all out, out there. And I hope to see you one day. Come to our support, our UK summer retreat. It's a big yeah. undertaking for us, uh, but it's a beautiful spot. So sign up for the newsletters and get some lovely ideas and attend some of the other webinars that are coming up over the year as well. So great meeting you all. And cool. uh, I'll see you, see you all soon. <laughs> Roger, thank you. Thanks for everybody's doing their version of applause on a global webinar. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to so many of you hanging in there uh, with all those questions. It's fantastic to be able to do that and to tap into Roger's wisdom. And um, you've got a few. So this Academy of Natural Healing is going to go on for several decades, isn't it? If you're going to be leading it to the age of 100. Plus. <laughs> well, I, didn't, I didn't think of that. I've got myself roped into it for. Okay, yeah, a centenary logo that. for it. <laughs> <laughs> Will you save the chat, please, Gina? Sorry, is it, repeat save the chat. The chat will come with a recording and I'll save it as well. So, yes. Thank you. <laughs> That's great, everyone.
Okay. Bye. Uh, I'll see everybody on Sunday. But uh, yeah, Roger's gone now. Uh, great. That was great, wasn't it, Judy? Yeah, yeah. Everybody's still here. <laughs> Lovely. Great. Thanks for joining us, folks. <laughs> get cooking. Get those. Get down to the butchers and get some bone broth. Well, get the bones for the broth. <laughs>